going to introduce Gary Woodall. He has been with the, well, he just retired from the National Weather Service after um, a long time. <laughs> 34 years. <laughs> yep, there it is. <laughs> and um, so today he's going to be talking about um, severe weather hazards and important safety tips and anything else weather related he can think of. I think he's also done like yeah, he's either talked storm chasing and that kind of thing. I don't know if he's actually done storm chasing. He has. So to me, that would be really cool. Uh, not that I would want to do it, but, you know, I like watching the movies where other people do it. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, this month's sponsor, who is Sandy Rapp, uh, for sponsoring us. And he, you know, he loves severe storms, tornadoes, um, hazardous weather. He also loves, um, his newest hobby is photography uh, not, at, at night with astronomy type things at night. So we might have him come back next year sometime and talk about that. It's really cool too. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Gary. All right. And I need to walk around when I'm talking, so I'm going to take this off. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, coming out and joining us here this afternoon. Again, my name is Gary Woodall. Um, I uh, worked for the National Weather Service for 34 years, as I mentioned. Nine of those years were at the uh, forecast office over in Fort Worth. And uh, my primary jobs were leading the severe weather education and preparedness efforts, conducting the uh, storm spotter training classes, and working with the TV meteorologists and the local emergency officials so that we were all as ready as we could be whenever severe weather approached. So um, if from about 2001 to 2009, you came to any of the storm spotter classes that are usually over at the uh, Fletcher Warren Civic Center, uh, you saw me there. So anyway, great to have you here today. Well, um, we're, we're through with summer, it looks like, finally. Summer that I, I didn't know if it was ever going to end. Kind of a rude welcome back to Texas. So Memphis, Tennessee was the office where I retired from. Uh, but we've gotten out of that, we're into fall now, we're getting weather systems coming through, we're getting rain again, we're getting temperature variations, all that stuff that means that hooray, summer is over with. But along with that uh, comes actually our secondary severe weather season here in North Texas. Uh, fall, no, uh, fall into early winter is our secondary season. In fact, if you've been paying attention to the weather, it looks like Friday we may have a, a threat for severe storms uh, across uh, North Texas. So we'll need to stay tuned for that. Then, of course, as we get into the new year, uh, then we start approaching spring, which uh, springtime is our primary season for severe weather in North Texas. So putting all that together, this is a good time for us all to go through and remind ourselves of the dangers, the hazards, and the threats the thunderstorms can bring, and to either learn or remind ourselves of some of the safety tips, the things that we'll need to do, uh, th uh, rules we'll need to follow, plans that we'll need to have in place if, in fact, a severe weather threatens us in the future. Now, there are basically six steps uh, that we need to follow to make sure that we are ready for severe weather. First, we need to learn the threats, the words, the terms that we associate with severe weather and severe storms. We'll, we'll run through those key terms here in just a moment. Second, we need to plan ahead of time where we're going to go and what we're going to do if a tornado or a severe storm threatens us. We can't wait until the sky is black off to the west and the storms are knocking at our door to try to figure out what we're going to do. It's too late then, basically. We need to make those plans ahead of time so that we're ready when those storms threaten. We need to practice our plan regularly, not only at the home, but um, at our, our schools, our workplaces, our businesses, our factories. Everybody needs to be practicing their plan as well so that we are sure that our plan will work. Uh, we know that everyone knows what to do, and we know how quickly we can get ourselves and those around us into those safe locations. We need to be able to receive the severe weather information. If we don't know that the storms are coming, then we can't really activate our plan, can we? So we, we need to have ways to get that severe weather information. And then when the storms do threaten, we need to act quickly. 
Now, during my time in the National Weather Service, I served on several service assessment teams, teams that would go in after significant weather disasters where there was a lot of uh, injuries and, and in some cases considerable loss of life that occurred, a lot of deaths that, are, that resulted. Most of the time, these two steps were the breakdowns in the system. People generally had plans, they knew what they were going to do, but they either didn't know that the storms were coming or they waited too long to enact their plans. So be able to get that information, act quickly if the storms threaten. And then have plans for after the storm as well. How you're going to uh, make contact again with your, your, your family, your uh, friends, neighbors, how you're going to reunite with the family. And you know, we have those plans for uh, if there's a fire in our house. OK, here's where we're going to meet, and here's where we're going to all get together. And so we need to have similar plans like that following severe weather as well. OK, so let's jump into the definitions now. First and most important among these definitions is the difference between a watch and a warning. Now, all watches, tornadoes, severe thunderstorm watches, mean that the conditions are becoming favorable. The ingredients are coming together that might produce tornadoes and or severe thunderstorms in the next several hours. Watches are valid for about six hours on the average and tend to cover a fairly large area. Uh, all of the, the counties that you see on this map, that was a, a large tornado watch that was issued on that particular day. That's not a live picture right now, but that's what, <laughs> the, what a typical watch might look like. Now, if we come under a watch, we can continue our normal activities, but we need to start paying closer attention to the weather because the watch means that uh, conditions are expected to kind of go downhill over the next few hours. A warning, on the other hand, is an urgent message indicating that storm spotters have observed a tornado or a severe thunderstorm, or the National Weather Service has detected a possible tornado or possible severe storm on radar. Warnings are valid for usually less than an hour and will usually be issued for the areas near the forecast movement of the storm, that red outline, that red polygon that we see on the map here. So if we come under a warning, listen closely to the information that's in that warning. There'll be a list of cities or communities that are going to be near the path of that storm. And if you hear cities and communities near you being mentioned, that's when we need to take the action. Don't wait until the storm is there, but if you're in the path, that's when you're going to need to take the actions that we're going to talk about here today. A tornado is defined as a rapidly rotating column of air attached to the base of the thunderstorm and in contact with the ground. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy definition there. No, no real problems there. The definition of a severe thunderstorm, though, does seem to cause a little bit more confusion. Now, the official definition of a severe thunderstorm is a storm which produces either hailstones one inch in diameter, about the size of a quarter or larger, and or wind gusts 58 miles an hour or stronger. The definition has nothing to do with lots of lightning and thunder, really heavy rainfall, really ugly, dark, scary looking clouds coming in. Only the wind, the hail, or technically a tornado would make a thunderstorm severe. Now, these severe thunderstorms can sometimes bring the same impacts, uh, the same threats that a tornado would bring, but usually over a much wider area, much larger area than would be hit by a tornado. So severe thunderstorms can be even greater threats to the, the large-scale area in North Texas as a whole. Okay, so with the storms that we get here in North Texas, we have five main threats that those storms will bring. Tornadoes, large hail, the uh, thunderstorm winds, the so-called straight line winds uh, from the storms, flash flooding, and lightning. Okay, little audience participation now, a little pop quiz here. Of those five threats, which one tends to get the most news coverage, the most news headlines when it happens? 
-hmm. Tornadoes, yeah. Uh, you know, visually, they're, you know, they're certainly frightening to look at and can certainly bring significant impacts, that's for sure. Which one of those kills the most people? Flash flooding. Standing. Flash flooding, the number one killer, not only in North Texas, but across the country as well. Nationwide, nearly 130 people will lose their lives in, in flood events. And the, the real sad thing here, the, the real shame, is that most of those deaths, a lot of those deaths, can be prevented. Uh, a lot of them happen in vehicles, people driving, or in some cases walking down into the flood water. Now sometimes we can't help it. A lot of these flash flood deaths occur at night when people just can't see the flood waters or don't know how deep the water is, what the condition of the roads like underneath those flood waters, and don't realize that they're in trouble until it's too late. But a lot of time, it's because people just don't give the flood waters the respect they deserve. It only takes about two feet of moving flood water to float a vehicle off the road. Even a good sized truck or an SUV will float in about two, two and a half feet of moving water. It only takes about six inches of moving water to knock a person off balance, so they may slip and fall in and get swept away. So these flood waters are very powerful forces that we have to deal with. So our flash flood safety tips. Turn around, don't drown is our the flood safety slogan uh, used nationwide. Stay clear of the flooded areas. If you're not near the flood, you're probably not going to get drowned in the flood, so it's a pretty good rule to, uh, to live by there. Um, stay away from the creeks and the ditches, especially uh, with young ones, little ones. Uh, it can be fascinating watching the floodwaters rush down a creek or, or a ditch, but those banks can get very muddy, easy for someone to slip and fall in and get swept away. And again, be really careful at night when uh, if you're, say, running along this uh, road here, this was down in uh, Robertson County, I believe, um, at night, normal highway speed, you probably wouldn't notice that that section of the bridge is missing until it was too late. So again, be very careful at night if we're dealing with possible flooding in the area. Severe thunderstorms, again, much more common actually than tornadoes. Uh, most of the damage that occurs in North Texas uh, occurs from severe thunderstorms, not necessarily from tornadoes. And like we mentioned earlier, sometimes these severe thunderstorms will affect much larger, much wider areas than the tornadoes will affect. So uh, maybe, a, a, again, a larger threat for North Texas as a whole. The strongest of our severe thunderstorms can bring hail larger than golf balls, baseball, tennis balls, softball sized hail in some cases. That can be extremely destructive. And these uh, strongest severe thunderstorms could bring wind gusts over 100 miles an hour. So again, bringing the same force that a small to medium sized tornado might bring, but over a much larger area. So our severe thunderstorm safety rules. Well, don't minimize the threat is the first thing that I would encourage. Uh, if, if a severe thunderstorm warning gets issued for your area, please resist the thought of, oh, it's just a severe thunderstorm warning. It's not a tornado warning, so it's not going to be that bad. The most destructive at the time, the most destructive single thunderstorm event occurred in uh, North Texas, 1996, I believe it was, the Mayfest uh, storm that moved across uh, Tarrant and Dallas counties in particular. Over a billion dollars worth of damage, 17 fatalities. We had tennis ball size to softball size hail driven by 70 to 75 mile an hour winds. We had a lightning fatality, we had flash flood fatalities. Everything but a tornado from out of that storm. And again, most destructive single thunderstorm event at that time in U.S. history. So if a severe thunderstorm is approaching your area, get inside a good strong building, stay away from the windows in case that severe storm has the strong wind gusts. Uh, if any debris were to hit the windows and shatter them, you want to stay away from those. Um, if we're dealing with strong winds, uh, want to stay uh, out of vehicles, stay out of the prefab buildings, uh, mobile homes, construction trailers, and the like. Uh, those will be susceptible to, to damage from the winds uh, that we find in that severe thunderstorm. 
Now, if we are dealing with hail that's smaller than about golf ball size, a vehicle will be okay, an okay shelter, uh, again, if we're dealing with hail. But if we're talking about hail that's two inches in diameter or larger, again, the tennis ball, the baseball size stuff, uh, vehicles are not where we're going to want to be. Because when the hail gets that big and that heavy, it may break those car windows, those vehicle windows, and, and that's going to be pretty dangerous there inside. And then we have tornadoes. Now, during an average year across all of Texas, about 132 tornadoes uh, we will see, number one in the nation. Uh, the strongest tornadoes can bring winds greater than 200 miles an hour. The longest lived tornadoes can last for over an hour and could cover over 50 miles along the ground. In fact, um, December of uh, last year, just before I retired from Memphis, uh, we had a tornado that was on the ground for about 90 miles across portions of Arkansas, Missouri, and uh, Northwest Tennessee. So uh, these very long-lived violent tornadoes are rare, only about one out of a hundred will fall into that category, but these are the ones that cause most of the deaths and injuries that we associate with tornadoes. Now, we rate tornadoes uh, using a scale called the Enhanced Fujita Scale. We cannot measure the wind speeds directly in a tornado. So what happens is meteorologists, often from the National Weather Service, sometimes from other agencies as well, uh, we'll go out and survey the damage that the tornado caused. We then will estimate the severity of the damage. Uh, you know, was the roof taken off? Did the walls collapse, etc.? Use that to come up with an estimated wind speed, and then we use the wind speed to assign that EF scale rating. And that scale goes from EF0 to EF5, where zeros and ones are considered weak tornadoes. Twos and threes are considered strong, fours and fives would be considered violent tornadoes. About 82% are weak, about 17% are strong, and again, about 1% fall into that violent category. Okay, so if we are at home, um, at our workplace, uh, at the store, at our kids' or grandkids' school, and a tornado is threatening, what should we do? Well, an underground shelter is the best place to be. How many of y'all have underground uh, shelters? Not real common here in North Texas. So then what do we do? Well, a small interior room, small interior hallway on the lowest floor is your next best bet. Uh, the rule of thumb is to try to put as many walls and roofs and ceilings as you can between yourself and the outside to give you as much protection as possible. You want to stay clear of the big, wide, hmm, Big wide span roofs like the auditoriums, gymnasiums, warehouses. Um, it's difficult for those <coughs> wide span roofs to hold up their own weight plus the force of a tornado's winds or a strong severe thunderstorm wind for that matter pushing against them. So want to stay clear of those wide span roof areas. Most of the, the deaths that occur in tornadoes occur when people are struck by the debris that's flying around them boards and bricks and pieces of glass and metal and everything else that's flying around the base of the tornado. So this will probably sound kind of silly, but it's good advice. If you have a motorcycle helmet or a bike helmet, uh, a football helmet, something of that sort, put it on when you get into your safe spot. Give your head a little extra protection. Uh, again, a quick thing to remember is get in, get down, cover up. Uh, the, the, the safety tips in a nutshell if you're in a building and a tornado approaches. Now, that sounds very straightforward, right? Interior room, interior hallway, yeah, no, no problem. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. This is a typical floor plan of the bottom floor of a two-story house. And uh, boy, you know, finding a safe spot there may be a little easier said than done because we have a lot of exterior walls there. Almost all the rooms have exterior walls, so they're all out. We have kind of some open concepts there, the kitchen to the breakfast room, the living room and the dining room, wide span, okay, that's out. So really, in this particular case, about all we would have is this little 
kind of cubby type area here would maybe be our best option here. Now maybe if there's a, a solid closet underneath that stairwell there, maybe that's something we could look at. Uh, but again, not a whole lot of options here. So again, finding that shelter area may be a little more of a challenge depending on how your, your home or your, your building is laid out. Okay, a little audience participation now. Again, I'm going to show you a few examples here, and I'll give you a minute to look at them and see if you think that these would be good areas to use as storm shelters or not. So what do you, what do you think about this first one here? Well, what we're looking at here, I, I agree with you all that said, that said no. I don't think I'd want to try to ride out a tornado under there. Uh, it's crawl space underneath the house. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. You notice the little screens right there and back there, so you know nothing that's really going to block the wind from coming roaring in there. Um, my personal concern, I see some of the cobwebs and stuff up there. Yeah. What other critters are hanging out in there that I may not want to run across? Uh, the tornado is threatening. Um, what is supporting the house? I again have done a lot of damage surveys following tornadoes and severe events and with this pier and beam type construction as it's called uh, the piers were often quite variable sometimes there were solid poured reinforced concrete sometimes there were cinder blocks stacked up that the house was sitting on so if some if the, if the winds hit the house slide it off the the to the slide it off where it's, it's beginning a little bit is it going to just collapse down into that crawl space area? So yeah, I would probably give this a thumbs down if I was trying to uh, uh, find a, a shelter area. Okay, how about this? No. <laughs> Negative. Uh, we are in a warehouse here, it looks like. Uh, so we've got the big wide span roof like we just talked about. And again, going to be hard for that to hold up under the strong winds. Uh, also, those walls may not be reinforced. I've seen some, uh, uh, some of these larger structures that would get hit by the wind. The roof would come up just a little bit, but then the whole wall would get blown in on whoever or whatever was inside there. So I uh, may have some more issues there with the walls. Uh, and then, of course, we got all this stuff stacked up here, which could be falling on whoever or whatever. So uh, again, probably a, probably a thumbs down here. Okay. One more example here. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's where that's at. <laughs> Excellent. We have some possibilities here, it looks like. Uh, it looks like it's a, a closet or an office. So, uh, no windows that we can see. But yes, we need to ask ourselves some questions about this, this location. Is it on the ground floor? Is it an interior uh, closet or office? Uh, do we have a solid door that we can close across here to, again, make this a little better shelter area? So if we can answer yes to all those questions, then yeah, this is probably going to be a pretty good spot to be. Excellent. Good job, everybody. And by the way, uh, when we're talking about these uh, shelter areas, notice all these we're talking about permanent type structures. If you're in a mobile home, uh, or again, a construction trailer or some sort of a prefab type building, you're going to want to find a safer place to, to be if a tornado threatens. Um, one of the other worst places we could be in a tornado is a vehicle. Um, we want to get out of the vehicle <coughs> inside a good, solid, sturdy building. Now, it doesn't have to be an armored bank, bank vault here. Um, a gas station, a restaurant, a convenience store, they'll usually have the, the refrigerator units or the, the storage units back away from those, those front windows. Any sort of, of a substantial building is going to be a better option uh, than being in a vehicle. Um, if you're out in the wide open country and uh, there's just no buildings nearby, a ditch or the lowest spot of ground you can find is kind of the last resort. However, our tornado-producing thunderstorms often bring very heavy rainfall as well, so you need to be concerned about flash flooding uh, as those storms are coming across as well. It's very easy for the winds of a tornado to get underneath the vehicle and pick it up, roll it over, bounce it along, bend it around a telephone pole, uh, or basically whatever it wants to do. Uh, 
if you are, say, at the store or uh, someplace taking care of business or something, and a storm is threatening, stay there until the storm passes by. They probably have their plans in place and know what to do if the storm's approaching. You'd be better off just staying there, hunkering down there, than trying to get home and possibly getting caught in your vehicle as that storm approaches. So uh, stay inside and please forget about the overpasses. They are not safe places to be in a tornado. In fact, this uh, picture here, you notice those light colored blotches underneath the overpass there. Those are the outlines of people that were literally sandblasted when a tornado moved across this overpass. One person was blown out from underneath there and killed, and those are underneath there in some cases actually had sand driven into their skin from the strength of the tornado winds. So again, forget about the overpasses for tornado shelters. Okay, so now let's talk about some ways that we can find out about how, what, what's going on with the storms and if some, something is threatening us. And one of these ways we're going to talk about is no weather radio. Did any of y'all have weather radios at home? A couple of you do. Excellent. Good. Um, well, weather radio is a 24-hour continuous broadcast from our local National Weather Service office, which is the office over in Fort Worth. They have transmitters uh, all across North Texas, a transmitter in Cumbie that uh, provides the best coverage for Hunt County. Basically, when they issue a watch or a warning, they'll send out special codes over the broadcast that will activate alarms on these weather radio receivers. Uh, it's kind of like a smoke detector for severe weather. It's a good way to think about it. The radios have a technology that will let you set the radio up to alarm only for watches and warnings for Hunt County, if you're right here in the middle of the county. If, say, you're over uh, on the west edge of the county, then you may want to have it set up for Hunt and Collin County, for example. But you can control that, so you won't get alerted for warnings for Sherman or Paris or uh, any, you know, uh, Bonham or anything like that. Uh, you do have some control there. Uh, it uses a, a, an automated system that uh, broadcasts the warnings quickly, and the radios have battery backup in case the power goes out. You can get these radios, by the way, at uh, some of the larger department stores, some of the home improvement type stores, about 30 to 35 dollars or so they, they wind up costing. Now, all of us, or probably almost all of us, have smartphones, uh, you know, an iPhone or an Android or something like that. And there are some companies that have, uh, have developed some really good severe weather warning apps for the phones. Uh, basically, what they will do is use the location services of, of your phone and the actual polygons, those actual warning areas, and will only alert you if you're in or very near one of those polygons. Uh, now, again, a lot of companies make these warning apps. Um, Make sure that whatever app you choose, it is broadcasting the official National Weather Service information for your, for your area. The commercial media, another valuable way to find out about severe weather. And they are the primary broadcasters of that severe weather information to their viewers and their listening audiences. Now the commercial media, and I, I'm speaking somewhat from experience here, having done this for nine years here in North Texas, um, work very closely with the local National Weather Service office. They'll conduct um, workshops and uh, visits back and forth before severe weather season, uh, making sure that everyone is, is prepared and ready to go, aware of any changes and the like. They'll collaborate very closely during storm events as well. You may hear the TV meteorologists mention NWS chat or the chat room that they're in. And that's actual direct contact with the NWS forecasters. Basically making sure that the consistent message is being broadcast between the NWS and all of the broadcast stations as well. Uh, National Weather Service Forecast Office in Fort Worth has a website, weather.gov slash Fort Worth. You can get all the latest information about Hunt County and all of North Texas. Hazardous weather graphics, if they're expecting severe weather, it's down there in the bottom of my picture here. You can get the forecast for right where you click your map, right where you click the mouse. Also links to any watches and warnings that are in effect for the area. 
The latest observations from the nearest observing site, Majors Field, in the case here of Greenville. Uh, the latest satellite and radar pictures as well. And some weather safety and climate information on their website as well. So a lot of weather information at weather.gov slash Fort Worth. Now some of you may be on social media, Facebook or Twitter uh, or YouTube and the like. And uh, there are a lot of good sources of information on social media as well. Facebook is used in particular by the National Weather Service offices for providing general information, kind of pre-event outlooks, large-scale briefings on what may be expected across all of North Texas with a particular uh, severe weather event. Twitter is often used for faster breaking information. Oh, let me back up here. Faster breaking information, like in this case, uh, a confirmed tornado on the ground and heading toward a couple of communities there that would need to uh, quickly take shelter if they haven't already. Uh, YouTube is another popular uh, tool for video briefings and updates on the severe weather that may be affecting or about to affect the area. Now, there are some very reputable social media sources out there. The National Weather Service, uh, the local media outlets, local emergency management, uh, government of, uh, officials. There are also some people out on social media that can produce impressive looking things, but I'll be blunt but honest here, may not know what they're talking about. So again, recommend if you are on social media, stick to those trusted, credible sources for the information. Okay, now we need to get down to the nitty gritty. We've talked about all the steps of our plans, now we need to kind of put it into, uh, into action. Who in our home, our workplace, our school, our business, is responsible for monitoring the severe weather information, especially on a day like Friday might be, when severe storms are in the forecasts. Who is responsible for actually pushing the button, the big red button, and activating our severe weather plan? Who is responsible for fanning word out? This is especially true for schools and businesses and the like. Who's responsible for fanning word out across that facility? Especially, again, if it's a, a large, uh, like, you know, uh, e-system, something like that, or a multi-building school campus. Who fans the word out across that facility? How long does it take everyone to get to shelter? That's why we need to practice ahead of time, so we know how long it takes, so we know how much lead time we need. And then do we have backups in place? Do we have people backups for our key players? Do we have technology backups? Uh, we should have at least three three different ways that we're going to get severe weather information. Don't rely on just one, because technology breaks every now and then. Um, and do we have, again, the technology if we need to get that word out to other people in our area? Situation awareness is important during severe weather. And again, if severe weather's in the forecast, we know, okay, yeah, we need to be ready. If the watch gets issued for the area, that's when we probably really seriously need to start monitoring the weather situation. And again, monitor the, the local radar on the internet, uh, the commercial media, uh, again, credible social media feeds for keeping up with the developments as those storms are developing and moving in closer toward our area. And hopefully this would, by, the, by keeping your awareness high, it would let you maybe get a jump on having your plans ready to go and activating either before or right as that warning is coming out for your area. So you won't, won't get caught behind the curve, basically, uh, when the storms do move in. So summarizing, again, have a severe weather plan. Hopefully you all already do, so hopefully this is just a really good review. But have that severe weather plan, practice it. Make sure everyone is comfortable with what they're going to have to do in a live severe weather situation. Make sure that your family members and, and co-workers know what to do if severe weather threatens. Sort of be a messenger, an information resource for them. Um, if you are at a workplace and if you're responsible for severe weather at your workplace, be, be sure to account for your staff members and any visitors that might be there as well. Have as many ways as possible to get that severe weather information 
and if the threat materializes, act quickly. Um, does anybody have a guess what the average lead time is of a tornado warning? How long it is between when, when the National Weather Service issues the tornado warning until the tornado hits? About how long that is? Anybody have a guess? I'm sorry? 10 or 15 minutes. It's about, it's about 11 to 12 minutes right now. So um, that's not a whole lot of time. And we need to spend that time as wisely as we can. Yes, sir. I thought a tornado warning was actually the, a tornado was spotted on the ground, so it's already in progress. Yeah, tornado warning can be issued either if spotters observe a tornado or if the meteorologists detect a possible tornado on radar. So it can be either storm spotters or the radar indications. Uh, and in some cases, though, uh, if, if it's a radar indication, we need to take that just as seriously because it could be that there is a tornado that's in progress and just hasn't been reported yet, something at night or obscured by rain or the like. But yeah, it can be either spotted or indications on, on radar. Great question. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. And with that, um, yeah, that was what I had. Are there any other questions that you have? Regarding the whether it touches the ground, no, the definition required to touch the ground. Yes. Are some of the uh, radar uh, uh, tornadoes not yet touching the ground? Well, by definition, it has to touch the ground to be a tornado. If, it's, if, it, if the rotating winds have not touched the ground, it's called a funnel cloud. At, at that point. So if you hear the term funnel or funnel cloud, then we, we have the uh, extension down from the cloud base, just no confirmation yet that it's actually on the ground. And, and the way we confirm that, the cloud does not have to come down and touch the ground. But what we teach the storm spotters is if they, if they see a funnel cloud, look for the whirling dust and debris being picked up off the ground underneath. That would be the confirmation that it, it is in contact with the ground. And, with some of the recent developments and enhancements to the Doppler radar system, sometimes now the meteorologists can actually see tornado debris that's been lofted up into the air high enough for the radar to be able to detect it. If you hear the, the TV meteorologists may talk about a debris signature that they see on radar, they're actually seeing debris that's been lofted up high enough for the radar to see. Now that doesn't help us with advanced warning because it, it has to be on the ground to be lofting that debris but it can confirm that, yes, the tornado is, is on the ground and it is doing damage. What's the worst one in history? Uh, the worst in history. Um, let's see, the longest track was actually the uh, tri-state tornado, uh, which was back in the uh, late 1920s, I believe. Uh, had a path that was, at the time, uh, measured at 221 miles. Now, there is some question amongst the meteorology community, was that one tornado or was it a series that were maybe close together and we just couldn't survey, you know, couldn't see where there, were, where there were gaps basically. We thought uh, back in December of 2020, this, this past December, that uh, December 10th, the tornadoes that started in Arkansas moved up through uh, Missouri, you know, northwest Tennessee and into Kentucky, hit the... Uh, the um, Candle Factory up, up there in Kentucky. There was a lot of discussion that that might have been one track. And if so, it would have broken that record. Well, um, it turned out that there was a gap in Northwest Tennessee, in uh, Obion County, Tennessee, if you're familiar with, with Northwest Tennessee. So the meteorologists uh, from the office in Memphis, me, had to go out through Obion County, look at that gap, and try to determine was it a big enough gap for it to be a separate tornado or not, and it was. So I was the villain that, <laughs> that determined it was not one continuous tornado to break the, the record. As far as wind speeds are concerned, the um, May 1999 tornado that hit uh, southwest of Oklahoma City and then moved up across Moore, Oklahoma, had probably the highest uh, estimated wind speeds. Uh, they actually had a portal Doppler radar measuring winds in, in that tornado and a few hundred feet above the ground measured winds of about 320 miles an hour in, in that tornado. And we saw the devastation that it caused as it moved, as it moved through, 
And it's more. Is that faster than most hurricanes or over? Yes. Um, yeah, the, the, the strongest hurricanes will have winds generally around uh, maybe 170 or so miles an hour, maybe gusting to around 200, so significantly higher. Gerald was another devastating tornado, and Gerald was devastating for two reasons. Number one, it was a violent tornado. It was a, an extremely powerful tornado. Number two, it was very slow moving as well. So it was effective, whereas the normal tornado may hit a structure for 15 seconds, 20 seconds or so. The Gerald tornado was moving so slow, this was back in 1997, that it may have been working on those buildings for a minute or two, uh, you know, a full minute or two. And so again, it was just, was just extremely devastating to, to those areas. We there. saw this, there's nothing but a slab. Yes. Mm -hmm. Look at this. And cattle were actually picked up and moved to another pasture. Yes. <laughs> and I, I also heard that not just the slabs, but plumbing being ripped up out from, from underneath the slabs and, and, and mm -hmm. with some of those. So yeah, very powerful tornado. Yes, ma'am. I just have a question. Where you said there was a gap in that one tornado, is that what causes them to like, I've heard people say like they jump, like they hit one house, but it jumped the neighbor's house and... Good question, yeah, about the, the, the gaps. And what we're talking about here was a scale. The scale was a little bit larger. This was probably three miles or so that, 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 that the gap was. Um, what happens in those cases, we have what are called cyclic supercells. That is, they produce one tornado after another after another. And so there was a little gap there. Now, what causes that smaller scale? One house gets hit and one house doesn't. Some tornadoes, and we see this a lot with the stronger tornadoes, are what are called multiple vortex tornadoes. It's one main circulation, but we have these little, looks like sub-tornadoes that kind of form and rotate around inside there. And it's those little, those little sub-tornadoes that have the strongest winds and the swaths of the most severe damage inside that overall tornado swath. So a lot of times it's where those little sub-tornadoes, those little sub-vortices move across so like that we can get much more A bunch of little damage. tornadoes and they just hit one and but didn't hit another. Right, and, and sometimes you'll hear people describe that as two or three tornado, little tornadoes that came together to make one big one. That is, is probably another indication that it was one of these multiple vortex. Okay. Yes, sir. Summer of uh, 2021, uh, my daughter was visiting relatives over in Kingman, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, while she was there, they said that a tornado hit. hit. And, and technically, to uh, it's not a part of Tornado Alley, and there's not, uh, I had never even heard of a tornado hitting in Arizona. Was that technically, yes, a real tornado, or was it not? Uh, uh, they, was it something else? It, it probably was. Um, I uh, actually, before I moved to Memphis, uh, worked in the office in Phoenix for five years. So I got to deal a little bit with the Southwest uh, US weather regime as well. Um, it was probably at the low end of the scale, as they often are, and could have been what the, the slang term for it is a land spout. It is a tornado, but it's basically similar to the water spouts that you would see down on the Gulf Coast during the summertime, just happened to be over, over land. My guess, again, just kind of guessing on this part, that it may have been a, a land spout type tornado that they had there during the, uh, during the summertime. Because you know, the summertime is their active thunderstorm season there in the southwest US, the monsoon season, they call it. Yeah, this was at the end of July or for part of August. Right, yeah, that'd be right, right in the heart of that. So uh, it, it quite possibly could have been one of these land spout type tornadoes that they saw. How about and, these little dirt devils you see in the, in the, in the desert? Dust devils, yes. Those are, uh, those are not actual tornadoes because those tend to occur on the hot, sunny, dry days versus when we have thunderstorms that are going on. But some of those can be uh, quite visually impressive, you know, 500, 1,000 feet tall and can cause damage. You know, they, I've seen where they've gone through picnic areas and thrown, you know, picnic tables and stuff like that around. So. Uh, they can they can at least cause some some light damage as well when they when they come through. When when you're in your car on the highway mm -hmm. and the straight line winds are uh, pushing you around a little bit, mm -hmm. how uh, how much wind does it take to uh, push you off the 
highway, and how do, how do you know when that's ha about to happen? Uh, good question. <clears throat> good question. And part of that would probably have to do with the other conditions. You know, is there a lot of ro a water on the roadway or you hydroplane a little easier? But probably if we're getting maybe 75 miles an hour or greater, uh, that's probably when we need to really start being concerned about that. Um, so if you hear, and then in the severe thunderstorm warnings, uh, the meteorologists will estimate what wind speeds and what hail sites they're expecting from the storm. And so if you start hearing 75, 80 miles an hour, uh, and if it's going to be hitting uh, crossways, uh, your broadside on the vehicle, then, then that's probably something that you need to be more concerned about than normal. And again, that may be a good time just to find some place to kind of pull off, chill out, let the storm pass by, and then, then head on. Yeah. Okay. With, this, with what they call global warming happening right now, mm -hmm. are you finding that are there are more tornadoes in the last, say, 20 years than there was before? Or is it just because the technology has gotten better? It, it may be a combination of both, actually. You know, we are we are seeing warmer temperatures now. You know, is it is it natural cycle? Is it man-made? You know, that is still being debated. But with the, the data shows we are seeing warmer temperatures than we did three, four, or five decades ago. So that may be contributing to more warm, moist air, which is sort of the fuel that helps get thunderstorms going, which could lead to um, you know more tornadoes occurring. But the other point that you brought up, I think, is, is probably also a contributor, and that's the fact that we have more trained storm spotters now than we did, say, 30 or 40 years ago. And you know, since everybody has a, a smartphone and every smartphone has a camera, I think a lot more is getting documented now than, uh, than, than previously. So it, it could well be a combination of both, both factors there. Do you have a possible forecast for the kind of weather we may have? Um, for when? <laughs> Which day? <laughs> for, well, fr Friday is going to be, uh -huh. it looks like our next stormy day. Yeah. And uh, probably from, from what I saw this morning, now this probably will change between now and Friday, so keep up with the, the forecast updates. But afternoon, evening looks like probably the greatest threat. And it looks like, uh, from what I saw this morning, it's going to be a line of thunderstorms that will form along the cold front that's moving through. And that would suggest that probably the winds, the, the thunderstorm winds, would be the main threat that we'd have to worry about. It looks like it's going to be moving through pretty steadily, so we will get probably a quick inch and a half, give or take, of rain uh, when it comes through. But it's probably not going to be one of these long duration, you know, four or five inch rain events that. That, that we get probably is going to be pretty moving through pretty steadily as it comes through. Do you have a favorite uh, app for your smartphone that you would recommend to friends or family? <laughs> that's my that's my son-in-law. <laughs> uh, that that's not for the professional, but for the for the average person. Sure. Um, yeah, I can I can do that now that I'm not working for the government anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> There, uh, there's one called um, IMAP Weather Radio. It's a, it's not a free, not a free one. Well, think um, about free. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll listen up you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, that one, it will actually, it actually uses the cell towers and kind of sends the warnings and you know, looks at the polygons and send it out, basically just to the cell towers that are covered by that warning area. The Red Cross has a free app called Tornado appropriately enough, which actually breaks it down by zip code. And if your zip code is in the warning area, then you'll get a, a notification that way. Uh, there is, um, for, for radar data, um, it's again, a not, first of all, as much as I, I love the National Weather Service, I mean, they were a part of my life for 34 years, their internet radar is awful right now. I, I, just, I, I, have, to, I have to be blunt and call it, call it the way it is. The National Weather Service. Oh. The, their, the radar is great. The internet display leaves a little to be desired. Um, I use a program called Radar Scope, uh, an app called Radar Scope for looking at my radar data. Again, it gets a little bit more into the weather nerd stuff that most people may may not be interested in, but 
It shows the radar. You can overlay the warning areas. Um, this radar. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's free. Excellent. Always, always a good point. Also, <laughs> check the uh, local TV stations, your favorite local TV stations. A lot of them will have pretty good weather apps that they would like locally as well. Yes, sir, and then we'll, then we'll come back to you, and then we'll come to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I wanted to know, we brought up a global warming model. And uh, throughout the history of the Earth, the, the weather and the stuff that we're having now, has that also been a factor back in the beginning? Or is it just man-made? Because have we seen this before? We, we have seen cycles before. You know, okay. We've had ice ages, and the dinosaur period was you know, a pretty warm period, right. and then another ice age. But the last hundred years or so, the evidence suggests things may be a little more severe of and a fluctuation ever. than... Than, than what they think earlier. So that's why there's some question, you know, some debate about what like, is this really a natural cycle or is it is it a natural cycle that humans are helping a little bit or is it something that we're, we're totally doing? That's the part that's still kind of up for debate. But it well, we've always you know, heard that uh, gas from the cows was called. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, wait a minute. I'm thinking the dinosaurs probably fell off a lot more than the cows. <laughs> Yeah, there, there certainly have been, again, there have been long-term cycles that we've seen. Just the question is, you know, what's because it has been a pretty sharp uptick you know, the last four or five decades or so. So what's what's going on there? And that's what we're still trying to trying to figure out for sure. Okay. Yes, sir. On that topic, uh, have you have it seen more like in the more industrial-sized countries, like uh, where there's more concrete? Uh, there would be more higher temperatures, say, in Africa, where there's not as much concrete and is not as industrialized. Uh, the temperature is varied, I guess you say, in the, the like our country compared to, say, Africa, which is not so industrialized. Well, and even on a smaller scale than that, um, you know, not, not the countries as a whole, yes, but in particular on the small scale, um, homework assignment for you all. When we get when we get on into the winter time and we get a clear, calm night, look at the temperature at Love Field versus the temperature at Majors Field. It'll probably be eight degrees or so warmer at Love Field. And again, it's called the urban heat island, and it's yeah, all that concrete uh, you know absorbs the the sunlight during the day and then just kind of radiates that heat out at night. The reason why I say that because I just like I said I used to live in Arizona and mm -hmm. I know the temperatures in Arizona. They were saying back in, say, the 1800s were uh, significantly less, like 10 to 15 degrees cooler. Yes. Even though it was still the desert, it was cooler uh, during the day and night because there wasn't as much concrete. Say in Phoenix, it would, uh, exactly. normal temperatures would be 100, and, you know, 100 degrees compared to 115 that it is now, but because of all the concrete. Yeah, University of Arizona and Arizona State both have atmospheric science departments, and that's that's one of the things that they're studying is yeah how the urbanization of the Phoenix area in particular has led to the, the hotter temperatures, and of course the official observing site of Phoenix, Sky Harbor Airport, right there in the middle of the metro area, and uh, so they're they're certainly seeing that, and uh, yeah, looking at you know not only the you know, the heat island and how it's growing, but then the effect it's having on, on people as well, as far as heat-related heat related fatalities and the like. Do we have time for one more, Susan? Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, and looking for safety areas for the family, etc. Mm -hmm. one common area that I always look at, both my house and other people's houses, is underneath the staircase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but once I get out of there, and I realize the heaviest part of this house is the staircase. <laughs> I, I, I lose a lot of confidence. So. Yeah, none, none of these things that we've talked about today are 100% guarantees. Uh, you need a lot of back staircase. when uh, Anna in Westminster got hit in 2006, I think it was, uh, there was a young man that uh, yeah, did all the right things. Uh, you know, they identified the stairwell. The stairwell as the safe place in their house. That was where they went. House got hit, staircase collapsed on him, and he was killed, unfortunately. So none of these are 100% guarantees, but what we're trying to do is make our odds as good as we can. And obviously, you know, if you're in the center, 
you're going to be safer than if you're standing next to the window. And if you're by an exterior wall, you're going to be safer than if you were outside. So really the name of the game is just, again, making our odds as good as we can. And uh, yes, there may be a higher power that uh, you know, kind of has the final say in that. I believe there probably is. Uh, but we need to make our odds as, as, as good as we can. And by the way, I, I went and visited my uncle uh, last month. They live in Lexington, Virginia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only one question, which was this was going to be my question. I know that uh, it seems like, it, especially here in, in Texas, they say, wait for a minute, the, the, the weather changes, wait five minutes, it'll change. When it becomes like your job, and so many people, they tend to want to kill the weather, man, because they, they'll, <laughs> they'll go ahead and they'll, they'll uh, uh, plan for something, and then the weather doesn't happen. Like the, like the weatherman said it was going to happen. How accurate really is meteorology as far as you, I mean, I know it's more of an educated guess, correct? Or is there actual, you, you know for a fact this is going to happen when it's going to happen? Yeah, we, we, two words that we never use in meteorology are always and never. <laughs> um, but because it's, it's an, an inexact science. You know, we don't have the computer horsepower or the ability to completely uh, imitate the atmosphere in those, those computer models that you hear the TV meteorologists and, and that, the, that the National Weather Service forecasters use. They're getting better and better because the, the equations are getting better, the computer horsepower is getting better, the data is getting better. Uh, you know, the, the Doppler radar data is amazing now compared to just what we had, say, 10 or 15 years ago. But um, we're, we're still trying to match wits with Mother Nature. And you know, a lot of the time we might win, but certainly not all the time. And so it's definitely an, an inexact science. Now, up in Alaska, they have a, uh, a kind of a, a antenna array, a big giant antenna array that has a lot of power to it. Those, uh, that, that whole, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not. Uh, but the, the national uh, government uses it to study the urban city, especially when they, sh they beam this thing up in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. whether or not it causes or changes weather patterns. Being a meteorologist, do you know whether or not that actually does cause or affect weather patterns? I would be quite surprised if it does, because the energy that's in the atmosphere um, is, is just staggering. Um, I've heard, I've heard uh, that you know, the energy that's released by a hurricane in one hour would be like a thousand A-bombs for hydrogen bombs per second. Um, that, you know, just the, the energy is just staggering that's, that's released in the atmosphere. Yes, there are some cloud seeding things that get done in the, the plains areas, uh, you know, trying to bring rain to areas. And, or, you know, instead of a few big hailstones, making a bunch of little hailstones that would be less damaging to the crops. There's some weather modification stuff that, 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 that probably has some, some success on a small scale, you know, an individual thunderstorm scale like that. But as far as large scale patterns, I would, I would be surprised, again, just because of the, the, the energy, the massive amounts of energy that are involved in the atmosphere. And there's always, there's always that one lingering question uh, with these weather modification experiments is we don't know if the atmosphere is just going to do that anyway, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever the experiment was. So um, there was a, uh, I know there was a project to try to modify hurricanes back in the 1960s called Project Storm Fury. Uh, they seeded a hurricane, it, took a, it, it was off the Atlantic coast, seeded a hurricane and it took a left and made landfall. Uh, was it going to do that anyway, or was it a result of the seeding? There were also a seeding experiments trying to dissipate the, uh, the, the eye wall, it's called that concentrated area right around the eye of the hurricane where the strongest winds are. Okay, we'll reduce the winds, and so we'll reduce the damage. Well, okay, they did that, but that broadened the wind field out, and so it increased the storm surge. Uh, the storm surge affected a larger area when the storm made landfall. So every action has a consequence. And again, I'm not sure if what we do, if the atmosphere is just going to do that anyway. When you say seeding, what are you talking about? What are they doing? Silver iodide crystals that will okay. drop into the clouds.
silver iodide crystals and make raindrops that would then fall out. Okay. All right. Well, great discussion, everybody. Again, thank you all so much for inviting me. Hopefully, we won't need to use any of this stuff on Friday. But if so, we'll hopefully be, be ready and, and good to go. Thank you all so much. All right. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, thank you all for coming. Next month's program is going to be Bobby Sparks. He's going to be talking about his archaeology collection. Um, and I think he also went on a trip as well overseas as part of it. Um, so have a great um, afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.